Welcome back grade 11. Yes, unit four, instinct or intellect. Exactly. So today we're going to talk about focus on writing. So if you guys can open your textbook for reading and writing, let's go to page 108. Yeah, this is also the last part of the unit and also the last part uh, that we're going to do for this unit in the semester. Focus on writing. Now, in this part, we kind of have this review for all the vocab that we've been learning throughout this unit, unit four. And so the first part, as I said, is the review. Here you see the instruction, two, or, two of the three words in each row have similar meaning to the bold-faced words from the reading. Now, I want you to cross out the word that does not belong. So you're not gonna cross out the word that belongs, but the one that does not belong, okay? So here we're kind of looking at synonyms. Which one fit, which one does not, and the one that doesn't fit, you cross out. You can pause your video to do so. Go ahead. Okay, awesome. So these were the words uh, one till 12 from reading one and the words 13 until 17 from reading two. It's important because this helps you to come up with synonyms for a particular word. And another thing is the importance to read instructions well. Yeah, because you can answer something wrong simply because you uh, misread the instruction. Many academic words, especially those used in the sciences, have Latin or Greek roots. That means the base form of the word. For example, the word psychologist comes from the Greek root psych, meaning mind. A psychologist is someone who's trained to study the mind and how it works. Another word for roots is also called etymology. Yeah. So in this case, we're going to look at some roots that we can find, Latin, Greek, there have been a lot of roots that we've used and how words came to be. Okay, here, number one, for each root, which is column one, find the words with that root in the readings and paragraphs that are indicated. So basically, um, let's just look at the second page first to have an idea. So here we have the table. Um, number one is the root, two is the meaning, three is what we can find in the text in the paragraph, four is the word, five is the meaning, and another word with the same root. So for instance, number one, psych, which means mind. We find that in um, reading one, paragraph six, the word of psychologist, the meaning is someone who's trained to study the mind, and other, uh, other words with the same root can be psychic. Okay, now, here what they ask you to do is, for each root in column one, find the word with that same root in the readings and paragraphs indicated, and then write the word in column four, and guess the meaning of the word using the meaning of the roots, and the context of the sentence in which you found the word, write the meaning in column five. Yeah. And then, in the last column, which is six, uh, write other words you can think of with the same root. So you can also access uh, an online dictionary whatsoever to help you do this. I would like you to fill out number two until 11, columns four, five, and six. Go ahead. Awesome means, well done. Now in our next Zoom meeting, we are going to talk about this. Is it important? Yes, it is. Um, we use roots for context or language analysis. Often when we come up across words that we don't know, um, we kind of take the prefix away, which is the, the, the letters before, yeah, um, the actual base word or the suffixes that come after the root. And then we really just look at the root itself, like, what does the root mean? Now, if you know a lot of roots um, that come from foreign languages, such as Latin and Greek, it's very easy for you to analyze the context 
or the meaning of a word. Yeah. And we would do that uh, in order to understand a context. So um, we call that deconstruction of a word, taking away the prefix, suffix, and looking at the root, which is the base word. Okay? Yeah. So now um, we get into our grammar. Yeah. We're going to examine the sentences and answer the questions. Um, let's look at A, B, and C. Animals have other abilities and can have elements of intelligence that humans lack. B. No human being can look at someone who is about to have a seizure and see or hear, smell, feel what's coming. C. Oscar Fung's fought back proudly in the afternoon when he was finally able to figure out how clever Hans was able to answer the questions. So, looking at sentences one to four, or questions. In sentence A, what elements of intelligence is the writer describing? What type of person does the writer say no human being can look at? Which afternoon is the writer describing? And what words begin with bold-faced phrases? I'd like you to answer questions one to four. Go ahead. Great, that brings us to the grammar point of today identifying adjective classes okay guys this goes back to an important part of syntax where we are looking at um, independent and dependent clauses so if you look at your ebook um, ebook for reading and writing you go to unit 4 and then you go to focus on writing there you will see the summary of the syntax all the sentence types yeah, from simple sentence, compound sentence, complex sentence, compound complex. That is all explained there. And then you will also see the two different clauses. We have the independent clause and the dependent clause. The independent clause can stand on its own because it has a subject, a verb, and a complete thought. But the dependent clauses cannot stand on its own. They need help from an independent clause. Sometimes the independent clause is called a main clause. Okay, now, the independent clause has only one type, but the dependent clauses, we've got three. We've got the adjective dependent clause, adverb dependent clause, noun dependent clause. So we mostly just say adjective clause, adverb clause, noun clause. Okay, if it's an adverb clause, it refers to an action. So in the independent clause, an action has been mentioned, which is further developed in the dependent clause. If it's a noun clause, it's basically a replacement of a noun, of a subject or of an object. So the noun is not mentioned, but described. If it is an adjective clause, it basically refers to an object that has been mentioned in the independent clause and further developed in the dependent clause. With Noun clauses we use connectors such as the WH words and WH ever words, whatever, whoever, whenever. With adjective clauses we use the related pronouns, that and which for things, objects, and that, who, whom for people. For the adjective clause we use subordinating conjunctions which refer to time, place, reason, and contrast. Now a dependent clause always starts with a connector either the subordinating conjunction if it's an adverb clause the wh or wh ever word if it's a noun clause or a related pronoun if it's an adjective clause okay you can read all that in your ebook because that is already compiled all together so please look at that because it is important for you to know this in order to um, increase the quality of your writing and speaking and also your context understanding. Okay, today we're gonna look at the adjective clauses, we're gonna look at identifying. What is that? Now, okay, so when we're looking at adjective dependent clauses, we've got also two types. We have the one that are restrictive and we've got the one that is non-restrictive, yeah? Um, here we call it identifying and non-identifying. So identifying adjective clauses are sometimes called restrictive relative clauses okay sometimes they call it different things but 
it's the same thing. So identifying means restrictive. Those are a group of words that act as adjective. They describe or identify noun, which is mentioned in the independent clause. These phrases come directly after the noun they describe and begin with a related pronoun that refers to the noun that they describe. They are a combination of two shorter sentences. So, when a sentence is identifying or also called restrictive, means that that dependent clause, which is the extra information, is very much needed. If we don't put it in, if we would only use the independent clause, we wouldn't really know what they're talking about. So the extra information, which is the so-called adjective clause, needs to be added in order to make sense of the sentence. Because it is needed, we do not use commas. For instance, he had a horse. The horse could answer mathematical questions. We make that into one sentence. He had a horse that could answer mathematical questions. So this becomes one sentence. It is a complex sentence because it is independent clause plus dependent. It becomes a complex sentence. If it is simple, a simple sentence is one independent clause. A compound sentence is two independent clauses combined by a coordinating conjunction, fanboys, remember? If it's complex, it is one independent, one dependent. When it's a compound complex, it is at least two independent and one or more dependent clauses. Okay, so he had a horse that could answer mathematical questions. That is the related pronoun that refers to horse. So that could answer mathematical questions is the dependent clause, the dependent the adjective dependent clause. That refers to the horse. There is no comma because this information is necessary. If we say uh, he had a horse, we don't know which horse. If I say, oh, well, he had a horse. Oh, yeah, which horse? From where? We will know. So in this sense, adding that could answer mathematical questions will tell us which horse we're talking about. So this information is necessary. For example, clever Hans lived in a small town. The small town was in Germany. The small town where clever Hans lived was in Germany. The small town was in Germany is the independent clause. Where clever Hans lived is the dependent clause. Where is the related pronoun that refers to the town. Awesome. So identifying uh, or adjective clauses uh, can be restrictive or non-restrictive. So if it's non-restrictive, it means that the extra information, which is the dependent clause, is not needed, but we just want to add it. But without it, the sentence is still clear. You have to use commas. Okay, so we use the commas because it's actually not needed. So we kind of put it, you know, comma, comma, like, like an extra. Yeah, when it's needed, we do not put the comma. Identifying adjective clauses begin with a related pronoun. Who for a person or people, which for things, that for things and people, when, uh, time, where or in which place or places, whose and in whose possession. Okay, so these are the related pronouns. Remember that the related pronoun replaces the noun it describes. The noun is not repeated because then it will become repetitive. I saw the horse, the scientist was testing the horse. I saw the horse that the scientist was testing. That way we only use the phrase the horse once. You don't say I saw the horse that the scientist was testing the horse. Cannot, you mention it only once, okay? So read the summary in your ebook, please, people, because I put it in there for a reason. Okay, so simple, compound, complex, compound, complex sentences, dependent and independent clauses. For the dependent clauses, we have noun clause, adjective clause, adverb clause. For the noun clause, WH, ever words. For the adjective clause, we use related pronouns. For the adverb clause, we use coordinating conjunctions. For the adjective clause, we have restrictive, which means the 
extra information is necessary, so no commas. Non-restricted means that extra information is not needed, so we use commas. Cool means. Okay, read the sentences and circle the correct or incorrect uh, for the underlined related verb nouns. If the pronoun is correct, add an alternative or other pronoun that could be used. If the pronoun is incorrect, write one or two pronouns that could be used. The scientist which observed Clever Hans wrote a book. That is wrong because this is a person and you can't use which for a person. Who or that? You're going to do number one. No, one is done. You're going to do number two until eight. Go ahead. Awesome beans. That brings us to activity three. Combine each pair of sentences into one sentence using an identifying adjective clause. So for instance, we've got Clever Hans was trained by a retired school teacher. The school teacher had taught science for many years. Now, how can we connect that? It can become Clever Hans was trained by a retired school teacher who had taught science for many years. Or the afternoon when Clever Hans was ready to perform in front of an audience was cold and rainy. The afternoon when Clever Hans was made blah, 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 was cold and rainy. So it can become the last part of the sentence or it can come in the middle of a sentence. And as you can see here, there are no commas because this information is needed. So it's identifying, restricted. So no commas. You are going to answer number three until 10. All right. <laughs> Good luck. Awesome beans. Okay, so that was the whole thing about the syntax of um, dependent clauses, adjective, restrictive adjective, dependent clauses, basically. We didn't really look at the non-restrictive. The non-restrictive ones are just the ones that um, no, doesn't need extra information. So basically, when does it need extra information? It needs it when the subject is not clear. So you don't know who you're talking about. And it needs it when, for example, the whole idea is not clear yet. So either the subject or the idea of the sentence isn't clear means it's restrictive or identifying. Yeah? Okay, don't forget to look at your ebook, yeah? Okay, for your final writing task, you're writing a summary of reading one as if you were a journalist writing for a newspaper and magazine. So you're going to be reporting the information in reading one definitely when you report you summarize because you never state everything exactly so you summarize the whole information but you write it in report format as if you are a journalist yeah so you had to ask answers with the wh questions and write the questions for each wh question and kind of make this mind map and this could definitely be your brainstorm for your writing project what who when where why how then you write the summary. A summary is a shortened version of a text that focuses on the thesis or the main idea. It does not include many details or examples and it does not include personal opinions. So what are some important points is one, read and reread the text. Think of the WH questions. Two, highlight or underline the thesis. Yeah, think about the purpose of the text and the main idea. Three, rewrite the thesis in one sentence using your own words. Four, continue reading. Highlight the main idea and keywords and phrases for each paragraph. Five, check your sentences against the text. Use your own wording. Six, make sure you have not included irrelevant examples of your own opinion. Seven, write your summary. Eight, return later and check it again with fresh eyes. And nine, polish, polish, summary of flow. Uh, it needs to read well so you have to have your coherence going well okay this is a summary of reading two yeah this is a good example for you so read it and i would like you to answer the two questions 
Awesome. So one, who is the author and what is the title of the article? And two, what is the thesis? Very important for you to be able to find those things. And number three, what are some of the problems of testing an animal's intelligence? Four, what is the author's conclusion about testing animal intelligence? Pause your video to answer this. Go ahead. Awesome. Before you begin to write a summary of reading one, practice by summarizing section, sections of the reading. Individual paragraphs, the body paragraphs, or groups of paragraphs. So for paragraphs one to seven, circle the sentence that best describes the main idea. For paragraphs eight to 10, write the one sentence summary yourself. Yeah. So read paragraph one of reading one, which statement best describes the main ideas of the paragraph? Can answer number one, two, three, four, five, and six. Go ahead. Okay, so number five, you had to write one sentence summary of the main idea uh, of paragraph eight, and then in six and paragraph nine and ten, you have to write a one sentence summary of the main idea. This is a very good practice, so try to do that right now. Awesome, then we come to the point where you have to have written your first draft of your summer of reading one, using the information uh, from prepare to write and write to plan your summer. Make sure you state the thesis and eliminate any unimportant details. Make sure your grammar and vocab uh, from this unit are used, yeah? Then when you re revise, uh, what is important is paraphrasing, yeah? When you summarize something, you have to restate what someone else has said, someone else's ideas. So if you put it in different words, it's called paraphrasing. It is very important to restate the author's ideas in your own words while keeping true to the author's ideas. So you're still stating what the author said, but you're just using different words. You're not gonna add information, leave out information, change information, but you're gonna write it in different words. And that is called paraphrasing. If you choose to use the author's direct words, exactly how the author said it, then you have to quote it using quotation marks. So here you can see a quote, uh, the author's own word as a quotation, question, uh, quotation marks. A group of scientists from Queen Mary University in London examined studies of animal intelligence to find out what scientists currently think about comparable cognition in different species. Yada, 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 yada. Um, period, quotation marks. So when using a direct quote, you use some rules. First, you lift the quote directly as it is, so you don't change it. Uh, don't change the capitalization or punctuation. Two, place a comma before the quote. Simonson concludes by quoting Gro Andam, who states, comma, quotation marks, scientist needs to develop yada, 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 period, quotation marks. And three, place the final punctuation mark at the end of the sentence before the final quotation mark, like here, period, quotation mark, not quotation mark, and then period, okay? Yeah. And we have here our uh, quoting verb states. Yeah, Adam who states, comma, quotation marks, scientists need, yada, 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 period, quotation marks. Now, when you report something, you paraphrase it, yeah? A further problem of animal intelligence testing is comparing intelligence across species. Scientists from Queen Mary University in London recently studied the learning speed of different species, yada, 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 yada. When paraphrasing or quoting, you use a variety of reporting verbs. So whether you're quoting or you are reporting, which is stating what someone has said in different words, you always do use um, a reporting verb. So here they use state, stated states, oh, where are we? Um, yeah, oh wait, here, um, states, who states, we have that here, yeah, studied, 
So it can be says, tells, acknowledges, concedes, states, explains, leaves, writes, things, mentions, notes, concluded. Do you see that? Concluded that. So whether you are quoting it or paraphrasing it, you have to use a reporting verb to introduce the author's ideas. That's very important, okay? Now, when paraphrasing, first think of the main idea or what the author is trying to tell you and think of ways to say the same thing using your own words. Do not use replace the words in a sentence with synonyms because it can end up being weird. Remember that in your summary, when you report the information of reading one, that you use a quote and that you report. The original sentence, many animals of extreme perception. Incorrect paraphrase, many animals of excellent awareness. You're changing the whole meaning, so it's wrong. So when you paraphrase, read the original text and make sure you understand it. If you don't understand it, you cannot paraphrase it. Highlight the main idea and keywords and phrases. Two, read the text again, put the text aside. Three, write the idea in your own words without looking at the text and try to use different words than the text. Four, try to reorder the ideas in the sentence, start with the middle to the end, or the end, put the paraphrase text aside for a while. Five, with fresh eyes, check your paraphrase sentence against the original, make sure it is not so close to the original, you didn't change the meaning, you didn't add meaning, and no personal opinion. Okay. So basically, when you paraphrase, you use different words, so synonyms, and you use a different grammatical order. You can kind of flip the sentence around, but make sure that it grammatically always works. Original, many animals have extreme perception. Correct paraphrase, animals that display a deep understanding of their world are common. Saying the same thing in different words. Okay, now it's your turn to uh, paraphrase the sentences from reading two in your own words. Try it out. You've got number one, two, and three. Go ahead. Awesome. Look at the first draft that you made. Make sure you have paraphrased the author of reading one using your own words. Check against the original text and make any changes if it's necessary. Add a quote and do paraphrasing. So you do the quoting and reporting. Look at your punctuation. Make sure you've used the uh, vocab and grammar of uh, this unit. And then you can edit your final writing. Does the summary include the author's name and title of reading? Include the thesis statement? Answer the WH questions? Uh, is it in your own words? Do you use a variety of reporting verbs? Do you have a quote and a reporting? Do you use quotes properly punctuated? Do you use any? Uh, reporting, did you use identifying adjective clauses and did you use the vocab and grammar from the unit? Awesome, that is amazing. Now, I hope that this is clear. Um, these are very important components though if it comes to writing, academic writing and also speaking basically. But as we're looking at writing right now, this is super important for your writing. Yeah, so um, I'm going to paraphrase with you or paraphrase review basically what we have been talking about today yeah. okay so we started off uh, we started off with our vocabulary review yeah of reading one and two and then we did an expansion on that um, we looked at the roots of words, uh, the Latin and Greek roots of words, and how other words are made out of those, um, using those roots. Then our grammar today was uh, identifying adjective clauses, simple compound complex, compound complex sentences, having an independent clause or a dependent. The dependent being noun, adjective and adverb clauses, and the adjective clauses can be identifying slash restrictive or non-identifying yeah non-restrictive duh <laughs> okay cool bean so you have to look at that and they have different connectors so we use the related pronouns and then um yeah you tried that one out and then we looked at your writing project as you're reporting the information of reading one in this unit um how to write a summary which means doesn't include any details and examples um, that the information can be quoted which is exact words with quotation marks in your writing 
and that you can also report the information but then you have to paraphrase use different words and a different grammatical s structure and make sure your grammar works yeah and for both quoting or reporting you need very strong reporting verbs yep awesome beans so that was all for today thank you for joining me you are awesome and i will see you very soon in your zoom meeting remember read your ebook for your syntax information summary and uh, i'm excited to see you soon take care god bless bye